we're carrying on with the paper we were working with last time when we looked at using the past paper for revision for a practical. So even though we're not doing the actual practical, there's a lovely way that we can use these papers and still get good experience of that. We went through the introduction um, and we determined that we are looking for an unknown concentration of protein with milk. We're given a known concentration. We work through doing simple dilution in order to figure out concentrations that we'd be working with. Um, and then going through this process of working through a test. Okay, so we are doing a test for protein, looking at the amount of protein, and we're working with a burette test, but from scratch with potassium hydroxide and copper sulfate solutions. So we got to the point of here, number nine, where we've done everything, and now we are looking at results. And this is where things get more interesting, because of course, <laughs> if you're doing this theoretically, you don't have any results in front of you. So we've, we're told to compare the color of, of our samples with the standard colors in figure 1.1, and record the color of the mixture in A part two. So um, A part two tells us to record your results in appropriate table for the known concentrations of milk using only the standard colors in figure 1.1, which means that we're really gonna have to be very careful that we only use this violet, pale violet, and blue. So what we want to do here is, is turn our brains on a little bit, okay? We know a burette test goes from blue to purple if it's positive. And we're working here with known concentrations of milk. So we are creating our results based on what we could expect to see. So our appropriate table, we would be drawing our cells. We'd be drawing all this with a ruler and a pencil, beautiful straight lines. We're only going to have two columns in our table because all we're looking at is the known concentration, so the percentage concentration of the milk. And then the result we're reporting, just one result, is the color of the mixture. So remember in your results tables, you very simply have your independent variable, what you've changed, and then your dependent variable, how it has responded. And we've got our six concentrations going on here from our, our simple dilution. So we had five concentrations that we made and then they gave us one that we must make. So we went from 1.0%, the original, then we went 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, which was uh, dropping by 0.2 every time. And then they told us we must also make 0 0.1. So if we turn our brains on and we think, okay, well, there's most to least, so let's, for a working hypothesis, go violet, violet, pale violet, pale violet, blue, and blue. So these ones have got so little protein in them that they effectively don't change color. And this is what we're sort of expecting we would expect, if we, if we got a, a blue one for 1.0 and a violet one for 0.1 in our crack, then we would be thinking, oh, there's something wrong there. So even when you're doing the actual experiment, you want to sort of have, what would I expect to see in a situation like this when I'm working with everything that is known? So if we then move to the next piece, it says, you are now required to estimate the concentration of milk in sample U. This provides a measure of the proteins in the milk. Okay, that makes sense. So where does U fall between all these different percentage concentrations? We have to put two drops of U onto the spotting tile, and we have to repeat steps six to nine with U. So it's working through this whole process of putting in the K, putting in the C, leaving for two minutes, 
waiting for the color to change, and then comparing to just these colors. And then they want us to record the color in A part three. So we're not putting you in our table, we just put in color for you in here. State the color for sample you. And now this is where you say, okay, but I don't have a you and I can't make a guess based on the information that I've got. And that is where we return to those instructions because in there, of course, we find that information of what is the concentration of you. So after all of your equipment that you're going to have, comes the instructions for preparation of materials. Fantastic. So it tells us how M was prepared. And then of course it tells us how U was prepared. So M is our milk um, and it's 10 grams of dried milk in 160 centimeters cubed of distilled water, mixing well and making up to 200 centimeters cubed. So we have 10 grams in 200 centimeters cubed. Okay, but, but there's the catch. Remember in the paper, they said that M is a 1%. Actually, this is a 5%. Okay, but they, they tell your exam, examiners not to, to fear, not to worry, or your people running your prac exam. Okay, this is a 5% concentration. A different concentration is intentionally stated in the question paper. Okay, your simple dilution is a lot easier to do with a 1% than it is with a 5%. So often they will do things like this in the background that you are completely unaware of. So it doesn't really make any difference. We're quite happy with this idea. We can call it whatever we want to, but M is actually a 5%. Okay, so how do they U? U is prepared by putting 70 centimeters cubed of M into 30 centimeters cubed of distilled water. Okay, so we've got then 0.7% M. Okay, so that gives us a 0.35% concentration. Now we've got to think, okay, so if we have a 0.35% concentration, that's going to be a little bit odd because in our paper, our highest percent concentration was one. So where on our scale of one, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, does this U map on? Because if we can understand where it maps on, then we know what that result should be. So in our paper, we have what's called a 1%. Okay, in our instructions, we have what's called a, well, what is, not even just what's called, a 5%. Okay, so we have a 3.5% for you. So there's M, this is U. So we want to know what does U map onto for our 1%. So we just flip these over, do our fractions, 3.5 divided by five. Our apparent U, so what we think U is going to be, it's actually going to be a 0.7% concentration. So we now know that the result for U should be 0.7. If we take that back to our paper, what it means is that U is going to fall right between 0.6 and 0.8. So that is an interesting one, okay? So somewhere in here, and now we've got to make a decision. Are we going to call it violet or are we going to call it pale violet? Let's call it violet. Okay, so we have our result for you. We've done a bit of guesswork, we've done a bit of shuffling and juggling, but remember this is because we're working just to get an idea of this rather than the actual factual. If it came to a um, final exam, then of course we'd have the actual colors. We'd be doing this back. So, they then say that figure 1.1 has only three colors. In A part two, more than one of the known concentrations may match you. 
and they do actually with our results. This means that an estimate of the concentration of milk protein in you may not be accurate. Brilliant. Well, that's true. We know that it's not accurate because it's just estimating. So using the result in A3, state the known concentrations of milk protein where the color result for you is the same. So now this can change depending on what you did in your experiment. So for us, we've said that you was coming out of violet, which means that it could be 0.8 or 1.0, and we need to give them both. So we've got 0.8% milk and 1.0% milk. Those are our known concentrations. So if we wanted to then get more detail, we'd have to be looking at that upper end of the concentration. We wouldn't bother with the low concentrations to get more detail on you. So now we've got our results. We've got our results for the known. We figured out where U is, what comes next? Consideration of what we're doing. A significant source of error in this procedure is the difficulty of matching the color to figure 1.1. Okay, whenever you're doing an experiment, you're looking for potential problems in the method. And whenever you're matching colors, then it's really difficult. I mean, your eyes might see different colors to my eyes. We're not exactly the same. And how close is close? And is it violet or is it pale violet? It's, it's tricky. Okay, so they then ask us to complete table 1.3 to suggest an improvement to this procedure of matching the color, the dependent variable, the one we're measuring. One other significant source of error in this procedure, and then an improvement to reduce this error. So remember, whenever you're looking for errors, it's things that's going to affect the experiment from within the experiment. It's not things that you may or may not do correctly, okay? It's fundamental flaws with the way the experiment is designed. So when it comes to color and it comes to matching colors and reading colors, you know, these improvements are not limited by budget. So we can go straight to that all expensive fun one. And the improvement would be then to Use a colorimeter. So we actually measure that color accurately rather than estimating it by eye. Another significant source of error. We have to go back to the method now for this. Okay, so we, we did a whole sort of thing where we prepared concentrations in test tubes. We used syringes. Okay, we mixed well. We labeled a spotting tile, that's all fine. We used a pipette to put two drops. And there it is. Whenever they say drops, problem. Okay, and here we're putting two drops, two drops, and then we're putting drops of K and drops of C. But of course, if you put two fat drops versus two small drops, the intensity of the color is going to be different for the sheer fact that you have different volumes. And that's always the case when it comes to drops. Drops are a very inaccurate way of measuring things because we have actually no control over the precise size. And in this case, we were looking at colors which are so very similar here. I mean, the, the intensity of violet and pale violet could very much be a difference simply in intensity caused by volume rather than actual color change. Now, the fact that we're using drops as a measurement is a real problem in this experiment. So our other significant source of error would be variation in drop sizes. Okay, and then we could have here volume in consistent. Okay, whenever we want to measure volume, we go to use something accurately. When we're measuring small volumes, then we want to use syringes. So we could have actually used another test tube. We could have put one mole instead of one drop. We could have just scaled up the whole things and measured in moles instead of drops, and then we would have been working with accurate volumes. So use a small syringe 
say a two centimeters cubed syringe to measure exact volumes of solutions. And then, hold on, we think, wait, that, there's something wrong there. Use a small syringe to measure exact volumes of solutions. So we go there, we cross out the A and we put small syringes because really to be accurate, we would want a small syringe for each solution. So always think through and if you need to edit what you've done, edit it clearly. There's nothing wrong with fine tuning your answer. And just try not to make it too sort of all over the place and the examiner can still follow what you're going on about. We now move on to part B. Remember that way back we, we talked about doing um, hydrochloric acid was provided. We haven't worked with that yet. So part B of this prac is actually another experiment. So part B says, a student suggested that another procedure to estimate the concentration of protein in milk could be to compare how much coagulation was produced in acidic conditions. Okay, so more protein, more coagulation. The student added acid to known concentrations of milk protein, this is sounding familiar, and observed a range of coagulation. So here we're looking at coagulation instead of color change with the burette. The concentration of milk protein in an unknown sample could then be estimated more accurately. So instead of looking at color, we're looking at coagulation, but effectively it's the same thing. You are provided with one mole per dm cubed hydrochloric acid labeled A, A for acid. It is recommended that you wear suitable eye protection. If A comes into contact with your skin, wash it off immediately under cold water. It's always important to take care, um, to note these safety procedures, to be aware of them and to follow those instructions. You may in your practice get chemicals you've never heard of and you don't want to be making assumptions about them in any way, shape or form. So always be careful of safety guidelines. They then inform us to read 12, two steps 16 before proceeding, which means we're gonna be doing a whole lot of things in a row. We wanna be sure of what we're doing before we start and get halfway through it. So in 12, they tell us to put 10 centimeters cubed of U into a test tube. In step 13, you'll be adding A to the milk in a test tube. Do not stir or mix A with the milk. Okay, put two centimeters cubed of A into each of the test tubes containing the known concentrations of milk protein from step four and U. So we've already got our known concentrations of milk because when we did our simple dilution, we prepared those concentrations. So all we had to do was add a test tube for U in this case. So now we are putting A, so we're putting our acid into each of these test tubes. And then we are observing the changes in the milk in all of the test tubes simultaneously for up to one minute. So it could be less than one minute. We're not gonna sit there for five minutes. If nothing's happened after one minute, something's gone wrong. Okay, if it should be up to one minute, then it shouldn't be more. So be careful to keep an eye on your time as you're working through these things. If coagulation is not visible after one minute, you may need to carefully tilt each test tube to move the milk and then observe the coagulation. And there it is. You see, if they're going to give you that something that might look funny, they're actually going to give you the instructions. This is why you really have to read everything. When they say read all those steps, you read all those steps. You've got to know what's coming. Using the observations from step 14 and step 15, so how much coagulation, and the key in figure 1.2, record the results in B part 1. So we have lots of pluses for most coagulation, all the way down to only one little plus for least coagulation. And we want to prepare the space below and record the results for the known concentrations of milk protein using figure 1.2. The known concentration. See, they don't ask us for you again. Our table is just our known concentrations. So we're doing the same thing to you 
and to all our known concentrations. We watch our coagulation and we go for it. Now, here we have to use our imagination again and our understanding. So, let's have a look at doing another imaginary results table. It's going to be very similar to the last one. Two columns again, drawn with a pencil and a ruler, beautiful precise corners, nothing like what I'm doing here. So we would have percentage concentration of milk again. Instead of color, we would have the coagulation score. They've told us to use figure 1.2, so we're going to draw a whole lot of pluses rather than giving descriptions here. So split it in for our six concentrations again. And then our 1.0, 0.8, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.7, 0.8, 0.7, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8, 0.8
This paper then goes on to do a graph, but we will tackle that in another lesson as we're running short on time today and I don't want to rush it. So just to recap a little bit of what this piece of the question did um, is they started off with the description of milk containing proteins and we want to then measure the concentration of proteins because that then has a real life application in making cheese. So we did two different versions of looking for an estimation of protein levels. We used a burette test to look at actual amount of protein. We worked with a known concentration of milk and we diluted that. So we had a simple dilution giving us known concentrations, which we could then compare that unknown concentration against. So we worked through a comparison in terms of color looking at what concentrations gave what colors. And then we work through a very similar test, but looking in coagulation instead of color. We got the same results because we were working with the same starting solution. At the same time, we were considering potential sources of error within this experiment, because you've always got to understand what you're doing in terms of the restrictions on what um, you can infer from your experiment. You, you've got to understand the, the, the method that you're doing and, and what potential problems that can cause and, and how that could impact on the quality of the results you get. And obviously, the fancier and the better and the more thorough your experiment, the more solid your results. So then we took this and we summed it all up on one little concentration line. And that tells us then where you falls with a nice linking of all of that back together. 